Hey folks, I'm J.B. Shreve with the Faithful Considerations podcast. Wanted to give you a little heads up on this podcast series that we're releasing right here, Manifesto, Life, Politics, and Reality in the Kingdom of God. This is a look at the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 to 7. Now, the only reason I, reason I wanted to put in this little uh, little bit of an intro beyond what we'll be doing in the podcast itself is to let you know we actually have a video series. This series which was originally released as a video series through YouTube. You can go to jbshreve.com and access that. So I wanted to do an audio version too for all of our podcast subscribers, our audio podcast subscribers. But I wanted to let you know that every once in a while within this podcast, I'll refer to visuals, um, maybe something that you're going to see instead of hear within the, the episode itself. And you can access that for free, jbshreve.com, the Faithful Considerations website. You should also subscribe to the YouTube channel. So I'm going to put this little intro at the forefront of every one of these episodes in the series as far as the audio version is concerned. Just want to make sure that you had it. And yeah, I think that'll do it. Let's jump into today's podcast episode, Manifesto, Life, Politics, and Reality in the Kingdom of God. Hey, welcome back, folks. I'm J.B. Shreve, your host at the Faithful Considerations Podcast, as well as the End of History Podcast. Today, we're jumping into episode two of this new series called The Manifesto, Life, Politics, and Reality in the Kingdom of God. Remember, in the last episode, I explained the timing of this series. It's deliberately meant to coincide with our wild and chaotic national election season. So this is your way out of the madness, is what I hope this series will be for you. Two questions after the last episode what is the revolution? In other words, define more clearly what that is. And what's the difference between religion and the revolution, what I'm calling the revolution. So I'm going to cut, touch base on that, that second one later in the, in the series. We'll do a deep dive into the difference between religion and the kingdom of God. Today, let's explore the nature, the setting of the revolution itself that Jesus introduced to us through this manifesto. I think you're going to find the life and times of first century Palestine awfully familiar to where we are today. So at the end of the Gospel of Luke, this is just before Jesus is assassinated right? We find him in the Garden of Gethsemane with his followers, his enemies, his political opponents. They believed that Jesus was at the, the height of his power. He was more dangerous than he had ever been in their eyes. Now, we know from other accounts in the Gospels that by this point in the journey, he had already raised Lazarus from the dead. He was healing the lame, healing the, the, the sick, healing the demon-possessed. Demon he had unleashed the incendiary teachings of this manifesto that we're looking at in this series. He had even found his own food supply. He could make food for thousands of people seemingly out of nowhere. And so when they looked at this, they they saw danger, all right? He 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 was someone who represented a threat to the establishment, to the leaders of the land, to the religious leaders of the day. Now his triumphal uh, triumphal entry into Jerusalem, that freaked out all of his enemies, right? That was even worse. The people had celebrated his arrival into the city, into Jerusalem, like some kind of conquering war hero. The political, the religious leaders, they felt if they didn't do something to stop him now, they would never be able to stop him. This was their moment. They had to take advantage of the moment now. His followers, for their part, they also thought the revolution, it's about to happen. So the kingdom of God was about to come down on earth as it was in heaven. Just like Jesus said, the revolution was about to begin. But then, there in the Garden of Gethsemane, joined by his closest followers, here comes his betrayer right? Judas Iscariot. Let me just read this passage here. It says, while he was still speaking, a crowd came up and the man who was called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? And I love this part right here. When Jesus's followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. Now, this is Peter, right? This is a guy who's driven by so much impulsiveness, so much emotion, always at the ready. And you can see him just boiling over, enraged at, at Judas's betrayal here in the garden, infuriated by the approach of these soldiers with the betrayer and ready for Jesus to say, let's go, let's take the city. It, it's on, right? So Peter whips out his sword, cuts the ear off of one of those who are confronting them. And now read this. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and he healed him. 
Now here's the part I really want to point out right here. Then Jesus said to the chief priest, the officers of the temple guard and the elders who had come for him, am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts and you did not lay a hand on me, but this is your hour when the darkness reigns. All right, so am I leading a rebellion? Am I a revolutionary? Now, the answer to this question that Jesus asked is, yeah, that's exactly what he is. Definitely, he's a revolutionary, right? But he wasn't what the people or the leaders expected. He wasn't what his political opponents expected. He wasn't even really what his followers expected. The revolution is moving into this next phase here at the garden, at this scene in the Garden of Gethsemane, but it's not going to look the way that everyone else thought that it would. That's why it was a revolution after all. It was a revolution from this world, a revolution for this world, and the world to come. It was also, and very importantly, a revolution of the heart and of the mind. We have to keep those in mind. So I have to lay out some of the setting here to, for us to really understand where Jesus began his revolution, to, for us to make better sense of this. So I'm going to lay out some context for you, some of the setting of what's going on in the Gospels at this point in first century Palestine. This, these are the scenes from the garden. Uh, these will help make scenes from the garden, from Jerusalem, all of the Gospels. And uh, we'll, get, we'll get to more of that, some of the specifics later. There was a time hundreds, maybe even a thousand years ago, before this moment, there in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Israel and the Jewish people, they were really pretty pretty significant in this part of the world. The heyday of their kingdom came during the days of King David, right? But that was long since past. All of that's in the past. The age of empires came and it swallowed up the ancient kingdoms of David and of Israel. The kingdom itself actually disintegrated before it was conquered by the likes of the Assyrians and then the Babylonians. Then those empires themselves, the Assyrians and the Babylonians, they actually got swallowed up as well. They faded into history. Next came the Persians than the Greeks. And by the time we get to first century AD, the empire of Rome is the dominant power of the land. But the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham and David, David, they held on to their cultural identity a lot better than most of the other conquered peoples and lands did during this time. And this was largely due to their conviction that they were the people of God, and most importantly, to their calling to carry and transmit the Word of God. So through the centuries, various scrolls came to shape the great book we know as the Bible today, specifically what we call the Old Testament today. Then you have, you have the Torah. You've got the the books of the kingdom, you've got the writings of the books of wisdom, and of course you've got the prophets. Now most of the writings of the prophets actually took shape during the decades when Israel was disintegrating, after they were even after they were conquered and taken into captivity in Babylon. So those writings, those words within the sacred scrolls, very important because they, they foretold about a coming Messiah right? Guess who? A coming Messiah, a conquering redeemer, a hero who would restore the power and the glory to the people of God. Now, there's literally hundreds of these prophecies in the Old Testament. This is just an example of one of them from Isaiah chapter 2. Let's read this. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountains of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we, we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares. I love this part. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So the prophets foretold about this ruler who would arise, who would restore glory and strength to the house of Israel. We see that right here. We see it over and over again in the books of the prophets. Even more than that, this Redeemer, this Messiah, he would judge the nations. He would revolutionize the way the world operated, and he would usher in a new age of the will of God that the, he would rule within. Literally hundreds of these prophets are scattered throughout the Old Testament books, especially in the prophets, but not just in the prophets. But by the time we get to the first century AD, first century Palestine AD, it sure doesn't look like the Messiah is coming anytime soon. Palestine was literally an occupied province. 
not even a hugely important one at this point. It was within the larger, larger Roman Empire, and the Romans, for their part, horribly brutal people, right? A horribly brutal empire. In all of ancient history, maybe only the, the Assyrians could compare with how ruthless, how brutal the Romans were. And in Palestine, that's what they called the land, formerly known as Israel by then. That's what the Romans called it. The Romans let the Jewish people go on living living out their religion, living out their culture, only in so far as it didn't interfere with Roman expansion, Roman power, and Roman order. So they had governors in place, like, you know, the guy Pontius Pilate, who we see in the New Testament. In New Testament, These are guys who made sure the taxes were collected. They also had a local puppet king in place. This was Herod. He was a proxy ruler of the Romans there in Palestine. It was his job to make sure the people complied, the people of Palestine, the Jewish people. It was Pilate's job to make sure the tax revenue was maintained there. And of course, there's the religious establishment. Now, these were folks, the folks who ascended to power within the culture of the Jewish people. If the hallmark of Jewish people was their history with God, their stewardship of the sacred scrolls, what we know of as the Bible today, then it's only normal that the most influential people within their culture, their society, would be the religious ones, right? But even that was the thing that was contested. The official religious leaders were known as the Sadducees. They held the, the office, the institutional power, such as the high priesthood, things like that. Notoriously corrupt group of people, all right? By the time the New Testament gets here, they were literally scheming and purchasing their way to one of the most sacred and highest positions within official uh, Judaism, right? The high priesthood there in Jerusalem. If you're not familiar or if you are familiar with the Old Testament priesthood, then you know that these guys were supposed to be the most influential people in Jewish society. The high priests were. Well, the Sadducees were just buying those positions. They were leveraging their influence. They would even bribe people to get a hold of the high priesthood position. Real corrupt. They had special garments, the high priesthood. They had special garments that they had to wear as they represented Israel before the Lord within the sacrificial system. But at that time, the Romans held on to those sacred garments. And the Sadducees, the high priest, they could only use those at the permission of the Romans. So that was kind of like how the Romans held, held their leverage over, over this uh, the high priest there, right? Through time, another influential group was arising among the religious leaders, and this is the party of the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were seen as purists, or what we would call fundamentalists today. Most of the people that I know today, that I've grown up around in the Bible Belt, they would probably have seen the Pharisees as the good guys. If they were growing up in first century Palestine, that's what they would have recognized. The Pharisees were defending the word, the message of God, against the corruption of the, the Sadducees. So that's the state of affairs in Palestine, the beginning of the first century AD. That's a nation far declined from its former glory. More than once in the past few centuries, in fact, there at the Jewish temple, it had been sacked. It had been even destroyed, corrupted by foreign invaders who even set up their own sacrifices to their own gods or, or different things within the sacred ch uh, chambers of the Jewish temple. So for the average Jew living in Palestine at this time in the first century, most probably di didn't get of a lot of thought to ancient prophecies, to the scrolls of the Bible, right? The, their lot in life was hard enough as it was. The Romans demanded unending taxes that they couldn't keep up, up with. The ruling Herod family was as corrupt as could be and just a figure for derision, for demoralization there within the society. And then there's the religious leaders. They're too busy playing their own power games. Like I said, I'll talk more about this in a later episode, but the religious leaders really didn't do a lot to aid in the hardship of most Palestinian Jews during this first century or during this time period, right? The Sadducees, they're corrupt. They were always going to use people and their needs and their weaknesses to leverage their own power, leverage the Sadducees' own power and their power bases. The Pharisees, on the other hand, may, have not, as been, may not have been as corrupt but they, they were also after influence, and they had a lot of influence. They were self-righteous people, hypocritical people. The, the average Palestinian Jew actually feared running into the wrong path against one of the Pharisees because the Pharisees could basically excommunicate them and ostracize them from Jewish society. So by the first century, this once great people had been simply decimated. The powers of Rome had defeated them politically. The powers of the re religious leaders had defeated them culturally and spiritually. So when you read through the Gospels, 
you'll see this sense of despair is really prevalent among the people. Jesus sees it. He, he has compassion on them. We read that in the Gospels. Jesus has compassion on the people. He weeps over Jerusalem. He's angered by the corruption. They're aimless. Jesus even says at one point, he says, they're like sheep without a shepherd. That's what he sees. Now, the one thing that downtrodden and oppressed people do tend to do is look for hope. They may have not had all of the scripture memorized, but most of the people were looking for hope. They were looking for some sort of deliverance by this time. And so by the first century AD, as the oppression and the, the despair has increased in Palestine among the Jews, many begin to hope for a deliverer. They look for that promised Messiah that the prophets talked about. Everyone probably had a theory about it, about how he would come, what he would look like, which, which party he would rise up from within. There were different false messiahs that rose up from time to time, in fact. They would start some little revolt or, or revolution, and then they'd be annihilated by the Romans. Anytime that happened, in fact, the reverberations, the, such as those revolts being squashed, it was usually felt by the Sadducees, by the people in the house of Herod, by the Pharisees. They, they recognized that the Romans were going to give them problems if these false messiahs rose up, these false revolutions rose up. So those figureheads and puppet rulers, they were really sensitive to the, the suggestions that the Messiah had come by this point in the first century AD. When people made those kind of claims, that usually meant danger for the power bases of the Herods and the, the religious leaders. So that's why the religious leaders and the Herods, they're so sensitive about these claims as we see when it comes to Jesus. He wasn't the first to make the claims. And in the minds of the leaders with Palestine, he was just another rabble rouser, just an, another guy who's gonna cause some trouble for them. At the birth of Jesus, if you remember, Herod initiates a massacre in Bethlehem to wipe out, just on the basis of a rumor that there's a Messiah that might be born there, right? He kills all, it's called the massacre of the innocents, kills every baby under two there in Bethlehem. The Sadducees and the Pharisees, they both came at Jesus hard throughout his ministry, questioning his credentials, questioning his legitimacy. They knew the Bible. They knew the prophecies about the coming Messiah. But by this point, they just doubted everyone, including Jesus, if that title was associated with them, because all of these folks just knew the word Messiah just meant trouble for them. The people knew about the Messiah too, of course. They all had their favorite verse, their, their favorite prophecy about what he would do when he came. How would he, he would restore power to David's throne. He would heal the brokenhearted. He would conquer the nations of the world and raise up the nation of God. This would be the one, right? So what's, that's the setting of the Gospels that begins in Palestine in the first century AD. An oppressed, a downtrodden people, a former kingdom called to glory, now in disarray and full of corruption. Narcissistic leaders interested in only their own power and their own riches, right? It really, it's really not unlike the society we live in today, to be honest. Now, I suppose most societies could say this throughout history, but our society today really seems pretty ripe for unrest, for upheaval. This was the scene also in first century Palestine. There were little extremist militia groups that even existed within the cities, the countryside of Palestine, just like today. Palestine was really vulnerable to the make Israel great again message that Herod tried to pursue. At one point, Herod, he goes and he renovates the temple in Jerusalem. And a lot of people were really impressed by that. The disciples, they pointed out to Jesus, it's actually recorded in Matthew 24. They say, look, isn't this incredible what, what's been built here? Jesus just dismisses it. He said, it's all going to be destroyed, right? Not one stone will be left on top of another. And don't put your trust here. Be careful about that. Palestine, yeah, in the first century, it's a lot like our society today. Some 2,000 years later, the church, religious leaders today, full of corruption and scandal. The political power brokers can't be trusted. A malaise, even a, a misery of sorts, fueled by oppression, rest over the people of this society, of our culture and our lands. That's what it looks like today. And that's one of the reasons why it's so signif significant how Jesus launched his ministry. We know very little about his childhood years, from, a, but around the time he was 30 years old, he goes out to be baptized by John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist is his cousin. He's also a prophet, and, and his specific mission in life was he was going, appointed, felt by God and knew by God, to be appointed to prepare the hearts of the people for the coming Messiah. Now, John the Baptist, he explicitly told the people that he himself was not the Messiah. 
right? That still didn't win him a lot of friends with the rulers of the day. He says, I'm not the Messiah, but they still didn't like him. He was always confronting them, the religious leaders, as hypocrites. When the religious leaders came to check out John the Baptist, this is recorded in Matthew 3, he actually calls them a brood of vipers. That's like just borderline cuss words there as far as what he's saying about these guys. Later, when Herod goes to check out John the Baptist, John the Baptist confronts him for committing adultery with his brother's wife. Now, it's always kind of funny, I guess even sad, I guess, when I hear people talk about these prophets that support, uh, surround former President Donald Trump, right? These guys are really nothing but sycophants, really. But when you compare what John the Baptist was doing with the leaders of the day to what these guys are doing, I'd like to see them handle the, his adultery, Donald Trump's adultery, the way John the Baptist confronted Herod's adultery. Probably not going to happen. John was preaching a message of revolution, too, but he freely admitted he wasn't the Messiah. But when Jesus, Jesus came to him, when Jesus showed up on the scene, John says, this is the guy. This is the one. Pay attention to this one right here. He baptizes Jesus. Then Jesus heads to the wilderness. But in Luke 4, as Jesus returns from the wilderness, he steps into the synagogue one day. And this right here is the launching of his ministry years. I probably should quit saying that word ministry years. This is the launching of his political career. This is where he sounds the herald to explain what his revolution will be all about. And this, these are the words that he reads. Let me just read this passage. Luke 4, it says, He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. These are one of the prophecies about the coming Messiah. And Jesus makes it real plain right here in this passage. This is about me. This is about Jesus. He's the one. The revolution is beginning. And for many, this period of beginning the revolution would be a period of enormous celebration, of excitement, of, of joy. But then for a lot of others, it would be a time of enormous frustration and even confusion. And we come back to the scene at the Garden of Gethsemane, where he calls out the timidity of these would-be assassins who come to him under the cover of night, even while he was speaking this whole time, proclaiming in the middle of the streets and temple every day his manifesto of the kingdom. Am I a rebel? Am I a revolutionary? Well, he was. He absolutely was. But the problem was, he didn't look like they envisioned him to look. He didn't fit their mold, their expectations for the revolution and the return to kingdom power. We all have assumptions and expectations, and we have to be really careful about that because God had something else in mind in the first century Palestine, and he likely has something else in mind today when it comes to, to the revolution in our society, the revolution in our hearts and minds. It's crazy that even though these people knew the verses, they knew the, the prophecies about the Messiah, but they missed the point. God was doing something in their generation that they would not believe, even if they saw it with their own eyes, even if they were told. That's the way the, uh, the prophet Habakkuk warned about it. I'm going to do something in your day that you wouldn't believe, even if you were told. It was happening right in front of their eyes, but they couldn't see it. They couldn't see it because they put too much of their own interest, too much of their own assumptions and, and expectations into the mix. When they looked at Jesus, some of their leaders said they, they saw a man possessed by demons. Think about that. So the Messiah, the Son of God, and they're seeing a man possessed by demons. Some saw a pro false prophet. Some saw a blasphemer. And yet he fulfilled every jot, every tittle of the law and the prophets. That's what he said he did. When we look at the manifesto of, of the kingdom of God, Jesus is real specific in how it's to work, how it is to function. It's not just about power out there, not at first. It's more about power in here first. It's about the change in here first, not the change out there. In our next episode, we're going to look at what his revolution was really all about. It's the political, the social revolution that so many missed, but God demanded be accomplished. We'll look at the heart 
of the kingdom revolution, the heart of the manifesto of the kingdom. That's coming in the next episode in this series, The Manifesto, Life, Politics, and Reality in the Kingdom of God. We'll see you next time.